Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic, where we aim to answer your bike and tech-related questions. This week is a special show because we're joined by none other than Josh Portner from Silka, formerly technical director of ZIT and, well, just bike nerd and engineer and marginal gains expert. So it's going to be a good one. Now, as ever, you can submit your questions down below in the comments section using the hashtag AskGCNTech, and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as possible in the allotted time. Alex, what's the first question? <laughs> I never know what the allotted time is. Um, first question is from Le Hockey Gabor. They say, whenever they watch gravel bike videos, they see people comparing them to hardtail mountain bikes, and it feels like people and all bike channels keep forgetting about another type of bike that is in between gravel and a hardtail, a cross bike. Um, not a single person seems to talk about this type of bike. It's either gravel or a hardtail mountain bike. But I feel like in their area, uh, most of the people ride cross bikes if they ride on a mix of road and off-road. Why are people not talking about cyclocross bikes? I Shall I throw it out there first, what I think? Um, I feel like a cyclocross bike has really been steered in the direction of almost like a dedicated race bike for that one specific purpose. Many of them don't even have bottle cage mounts, and they don't have many mm. mudguard mounts for accessories and stuff like that. Whereas a gravel bike feels more like a... Swiss Army knife, where it's got loads of different stuff that it can do. Cross bike feels quite specific to me. What do you think, Josh? I, I agree. I, I think a lot of the cross bikes have been designed around UCI tire clearance, so yep. they can't handle tires much bigger than that 33, 35 millimeter, but also high bottom brackets and high yes. top tubes for shouldering. Yeah. Um, you know, take away a little bit of the comfort um, that you get with gravel bikes and then the wheelbases tend to be shorter too, yeah. so. Make them snappy. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, for most people, and the only reason to get a, a cross bike is if you're entering UCI sanctioned cross races where you actually need a cross yeah. bike. For everyone else, and in a lot of local cross races, you could just use a gravel bike. Yeah. Because the, the rules aren't as strict and you have loads of fun and you'd have a more adaptable bike. You can often, yeah, like put mud guards on them, fenders. Or, Fenders. Um, <laughs> just translating to Josh. Or you could, um, or you could put on, um, uh, there's mounts for like bags and stuff as well. Yeah. So you've got a much more adaptable system, I think. Okay, fair play. Yeah. Uh, next question is from Bill Hobsetter. They say, would it be more beneficial for heavier road bike riders? And they say Clydesdales. Is this a horse? Am I right with that type of horse? Um, so would it be more beneficial for them to ride tubeless tyres than to use inner tubes? Is there an advantage to tubeless tyres that you're not going to get pinch flats? And they also said they'd like to see more videos geared towards Clydesdale riders, or heavier riders, I guess. And um, Josh, tubeless tyres, presumably that is correct. One of the advantages is that you're not going to get pinch flats with an inner tube. But what are the other advantages that, say, a heavier rider could have from tubeless? The big one for me is tyre size, mm -hmm. right? So the, the, the challenge for heavier riders with tubeless is that if you are running them at lower pressures, you're not going to pinch flat, but the likelihood of damaging a rim in an impact are greater because there's just more energy involved. Uh -huh. So it's really more about tyre size than tyre type, okay. as far as I'm concerned. So in that instance, would you go 30 mil tires wider? I think it depends on the terrain you're riding and, and your actual weight. But yeah, if you're you know, 30, 32, I mean, I'm, I'm big in the belief that when all this shakes out, <laughs> as tires have been getting bigger for the last yeah. 15 years, I think 32 is probably going to be about our optimal number. That's uh, interesting. It's about... That, that still feels pretty wide. Yeah. It's, oh, it's definitely pretty wide, <laughs> yeah. but it's, you know, that, that puts you within rule of 105 at a rim that's probably in the 36 That's a big rim. Big yeah. rim, but mm. not, not too big. Um, fits within most gravel bikes, kind of the wide road bike, um, and it's a good, I mean, if you're a heavier rider, that's a great width for you. You can still run a reasonable pressure. All right. All right. Right, next question on the uh, Next question is from Eirik B. Alton, who says, the dork disc that a lot of <laughs> bikes are delivered with is the first thing you modify on a new bike. Get it off. But have has anyone considered that it has a positive aero effect and should stay on? I feel you're the perfect person to ask yeah. this, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Dork discs, talk to us. Wow, the, the big pie plate spoke protector, funny... <laughs> Funny, sad story. When I was at Zip, we had to, for EU law, um, install this and sell it on Zip wheels going into Europe. And so when I designed that part, I actually put in the tooling the words, uh, a spoke protector on a Zip wheel, <laughs> cut here. 
Yeah, because why would you have a why would you have it on the set? Because it, it seemed yeah. insane. Yeah. And and when we first started importing the wheels, uh, we got caught and uh, caught we were, by who? The, by the, the fun police. The fun police in Brussels, <laughs> and and we're forced to retool the part. And so what started out as a good joke ended up being about a twelve, fifteen thousand dollar tool. So all error. the wheels had to have the dog disc changed. All the wheels had to have them changed. <laughs> and this was yeah. this was you. This was me. Do you get oh, in trouble no. for that? Uh, I did get in a little bit of, tr <laughs> of trouble. That, would, that was by the time uh, SRAM had purchased Zip, and so we actually yeah had corporate SRAM people to answer to, and they were. Why? Yeah. Why did you cost us fifteen thousand dollars in tooling? Sorry. I can imagine wow. sitting there in front of like a, a board of directors yeah. being like, yeah, "Yeah, I thought it was really funny at the time." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Next but does question. it have a positive error effect? Absolutely not. I would say unlikely. Maybe, maybe something, but probably not. Cut I like off. the way that's the, sci the scientist answer. It's just like I haven't fully tested it, so I can't. But yeah. Um, do you want to go, John? John Lee. Yeah. So John Lee says, "Can someone help me?" I've just bought some new tyres and all the gubbins to go tubeless on my summer wheels. But I want to know what spares or repair kits do you carry when you go out? It seems like you have to carry more because you still take a spare tube, patches, mini pump, as I did before, but now also want to take tubeless kit, tyre seals, ream tools, CO2. God. Am I overthinking this? Please help, please. <laughs> P.S. I don't want to be carrying loads of stuff. I need to keep spacing my pockets for snacks. And then he's put a sad face. I I I go for Alan. I think they're overthinking this. Yeah. And you don't need all of that stuff. When no. I go out riding, I'm using tubeless tires for years. I just take the same as I've always taken. I take a pump, a tire lever, and an inner tube. Worst case scenario, I, I add one. You just I add clean some, it out. something to that. I got, oh, yeah, because and this is something I take even when I'm not running tubeless. Some kind of like patch, usually mm. an old piece of tire, yeah. just in case I get that horrible side wall. Yeah. Gash that yeah. the inner tube would hemorrhage out of, but that's going to be the same on a tubeless as it would be for a, a tube tire. Uh, Josh, you in agreement with that? Uh, total agreement. I I'll just pack money, good dollar bill, pound note makes well, a pound nice, note makes was discontinued a, a long, long time ago. Yeah. No. Well, the only way you get a pound in England is a coin, yeah. which is not that useful. So you'd have to take what a fiver? Or yeah. A ten? Oh mm. wow. Yeah, yeah it's that's a, lot a little bit expensive. <laughs> Okay, yeah. maybe, maybe your tire boot is a better. Yeah, we, we still have a dollar. I'll give you a yeah, dollar. dollar uh, American yeah. dollar, and yeah. you can use that as your tire boot, although you can't yeah. spend it. Um, yeah, I, I've been yeah. on tubeless for forever, and same thing. I, I actually don't even take the tire lever in tube. I just take a plug, and, uh, and I still ride a frame pump because I'm old school. Oh, yeah. Okay, is I like silk it. silk frame pump? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> of, of course. Yeah. What would you do if Josh said no? <laughs> <You're shocked. laughs> Um, yeah. Elliot Cohen says, I really loved the video about the something and wheels a couple of weeks back, but I've been wondering whether spoke patterns really make a difference to the performance of the bike, or is it more just the fact that it gives it a pretty pattern on the wheel? Now, wow. I've got no idea. Spoke patterns. Spoke lacing. Uh, yeah, so the, the more radial the spokes uh, are, generally the kind of the harder the wheel's gonna ride from the, because the forces are just coming straight up radially. Um, as you start crossing, you gain torsional stiffness in the wheel and you gain a little bit of um, comfort. And so there is a pretty good reason that something like three cross has you know, kind of been the standard for years and years. As you go fewer spokes though, a lot of those lacing options start to go away. Um, so I would say most of, of the spoke lacing I see in the market right now is sort of aesthetics um, or weight focused. That the more radial the spoke, the shorter it is, so the lighter. Is, is the spoke wheel can patterns be built. are not also like aero focused by reducing rotational drag by having fewer spokes? A little bit, but it's it's fairly minor. So yeah, you think of the the spokes are both shorter the more radial they are, and you can generally, at least on a front wheel, get away with fewer of them. Um, not. Now that we have disc wheels, it's probably yeah. more about wheel structure um, than anything else. But I, I think the, the product in the market that I see today is generally so good and the, the technology, the science has gotten so good behind it that it's, it's most likely cosmetic right. uh, oh, when, wow. when okay. people are making these changes. Interesting. Um, Question about chain lubricants here. Oh, from you're going to love this one. Carolus S. <laughs> is PTFE chain grease any good compared to wax? And could could you elaborate a bit more on PTFE? Oh, man. <laughs> so you guys know my feeling on Trigger this. Warning. No. Trigger warning. 
So P PTFE is, is part of a group of chemicals that are broadly known as the PFAS or PFAS. Um, and these are like magic chemicals developed really in the 50s, uh, 60s around the space programs. But as it's turned out, they are incredibly toxic. Um, and because of the way the molecules work, they never break down. And so okay. some people call them forever chemicals. Carbon fluorine bond. Is one of is an exceptionally strong yeah. covalent bond. I'm yeah. going to get because really fluorine is soon. so electronegative. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I thought. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's one of the. So these are all fluorinated uh, chemicals, which is the F in the PTFE or the PFOA or the PFAS. Um, yeah, so it's just proven to be really bad stuff. And it turns out for all these years, I mean, we got we went as far as we were coating. Uh, the paper that they wrap a hamburger in at McDonald's in this stuff because it's so non-stick. And now it turns out that it can cause uh, birth defects and all sorts of cancers Whoa. and other things. So uh, so countries largely starting in Europe are starting to, to eliminate it. I know in America we're, we're pretty loosey-goosey on that stuff. Um, I think only California is beginning to care. But yeah, our, we've taken a stance as a company that we will not use any PTA or PFAS chemical or precursor uh, or byproduct of that to try to just eliminate it from the entire supply chain. Um, so the answer is, you know, is PTFE any good? It, it technically was good product, but mm -hmm. it has huge side effects. Now, mm -hmm. the flip side of that is there are modern additives that are safe uh, that actually work a whole lot better than PTFE. Um, we're big fans at Silka of... Uh, tungsten disulfide, which is even more lubricious than PTFE and is bioneutral, so it doesn't cause any oh. health effects for anything. <clears throat> yeah. But there's graphenes, uh, which we also use, uh, and a number of other uh, much safer additives that you can put into lubricants. So yeah, I would recommend everybody, please stop buying yeah. things with PFAS chemicals. Yeah, Fair. I think we'd, well, we'd second that, but also yeah. waxing's just way better for your chain. Yeah. We've got loads of videos on waxing. You can check them out. We're going to do a deep dive in that in a bit. Yeah. Um, incredible username next. Tom and Rach was first dance. They Love say, um, with the speeds I, of races getting faster and faster. That's Rochelle. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Rochelle. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Bad bad reading on my part. Um, with the speeds of race getting faster and faster, in your opinion, what do you think has had the biggest impact? The bike tech, aero frames, deep wheels, or things like training and nutrition. It seems like riders are on point with nutrition now and training with all the programs and smart trainers. Do you think this is the, is there one thing that's the bigger difference or do you think it's everything? Oh, it's certainly everything. Um, I think the, the nonlinearity of aerodynamics really, uh, particularly at the speeds the riders are riding now, just makes the aero thing so big, right? We talk about the, and there's programs you can look at online that'll calculate this for you. But I mean, the difference now to go, you know, 30 miles an hour versus 31 miles an hour, it, it's massive. I mean, there's no training and nutrition and all the other stuff is not finding you that next hundred watts, right? If you're yeah. if if you're at 500, you know, there is no 600 uh, prolonged, you know, for so a huge bit of that is all of the bike tech. Um, coming into play, and the, and the one I love to go back to on this is the the Boardman hour records, right? You know, Boardman did his kind of unlimited hour record and his uh, Merckx style hour record, and you know the difference was like what fourteen kilometers or something. <laughs> That's <laughs> it crazy, just, isn't it? And and now with the technology going further, we have Ghana, who's blown that out of the water. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, again, and, it's by the same token. It's like you know, with, when we did the hour record. With with like modern tech, I mean, I I, well, I wasn't able to beat Eddie Merckx, but I was pretty close to what he did, and he was Eddie Merckx, and I'm me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Let's just be clear. Like, yeah. 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 It's pretty amazing. And I'm clearly misspeaking. Seven k an hour, I think. Right. It went from forty nine to fifty six. Yeah. And you were able to almost hit the forty nine. It, yeah. It's and I think we we estimate the Merckx at altitude. Uh, the Mexico City, I mean, super higher even than any track anybody's using right now. And they estimate that he was still making something like 380 watts at that That's altitude. That's crazy, it's isn't it? Just bonkers. That is bonkers. So Aero's coming up top for you generally? Yeah, I, you know, I okay. think, well, I, I know for myself with the uh, one day a week of riding that I do, all the Aero in the world can help me hang on the back of the group ride that I do. Um, and I know my power and it's not pretty. 
<laughs> okay, right, I've got one final quick question for you. Someone asked me this the other day, and I said I would ask you. So, how important is wheel weight to performance, and at what speeds do you start to see aero becoming more beneficial than the wheel weight? So, the simplest way to answer that, we did a big calculation, uh, gosh, with Cervelo some years back, and, and the simplest way to think is if you're making, you can make 250 watts, the crossover point in terms of slope for you is about 7.5%. So if it's uh, shallower than 7.5%, aero will dominate. If it's steeper than that, the weight begins to oh, dominate. Okay. And yeah. so for most people, um, you know, riding kind of mixed terrain, I would generally err on the side of aero. Yeah. Uh, I think the technology right now, too, is such that the weight penalties for aero aren't nearly what they were 20 years ago, right? Yeah. The, the aero bike and the light bike are really just not that different um, in weight, but they can be quite different in aero performance terms. Okay, mega. Yeah. Well, that's been really interesting. Um, as always, keep commenting your questions in the comment section down below. But we can't promise Josh is going to be back every week. It's a long flight over, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so next week it'll just be Ollie and I. Right, Ravi. See you later.